This evening we have a subject which is probably one of the most difficult in the entire field of our interest. It has been said that the history of the study of consciousness is the history of religion, philosophy, and science. But these fields all depend, finally, on the gradual unfoldment of concepts concerning the power to know, the means by which knowledge is attained, and all the other ramifications by which reason and judgment can be derived from experiences of awareness. Some of the uh, early modern philosophers were of the opinion that the term consciousness should be dropped entirely as having developed gradually around itself such a frustration of meanings that it was no longer possible to use the term or the word intelligibly. Today it means almost anything that the individual wants it to mean. He applies it to every type of cognition, and he also involves it in nearly all of his spiritual and religious beliefs and ideas, with the result but semantically the word lost boundaries and since the 19th century has been in comparative chaos as to internal structure. I don't agree, however, that we can afford to drop it as a word or seek for a substitute. Rather, I think we must clarify in so much as we can the essential meaning of our term and try to rescue it from the involvements into which it has fallen. As might be naturally supposed, our first difficulty is to define the term consciousness. Trying to discover what it actually means. What do we discover? What do we actually find? Apparently the term consciousness is most generally used to cover the field which we term awareness. It is a power or a faculty by which we are aware. By awareness we mean awakeness. We mean that these faculties are in a position or in a condition to accept the stimuli that may come to them from a variety of sources, external or internal. Awareness, therefore, is the state of being in the presence of a recognized phenomenon of some kind. We are aware of things around us. And this brings us to the first question that has been asked. Is man aware of the fact that he is aware? Up to a very recent time there is reason to doubt that. Awareness was an acceptance. The individual turned his attention from one thing to another and accepted into his nature the testimonies of his senses, things seen, heard, touched, flowed into him, but he was not aware of himself in relationship to these things. He was not aware, for example, that his own consciousness accepted or rejected these phenomena by intent or purpose. It was merely a something forever available to become aware of whatever stimuli uh, was brought within its range. <coughs> Gradually, however, 
the investigation of phenomena has led to the conclusion that whether we are aware of our own awareness or not, that there is a certain continuous activity from within ourselves, even in the most simple problem of seeing. Seeing is not merely the sense of sight registering its own testimony upon something within man. The seeing involves a motion from within man, a motion of experience, a motion of inevitable and intuitive recognitions. The individual seeing, whether he is aware of it or not, immediately begins to estimate the thing seen. A power within himself begins to pass judgment upon the thing seen. And this judgment is nearly always based upon experience, based upon memory, or upon previous instances in which similar things have been seen, or upon comparison, or perhaps upon the intuitive sense of utilities involved. Whether we know it or not, we always see with a certain appraising power. We are constantly passing some kind of judgment about the things seen, accepting it, rejecting it, liking it, disliking it, responding to it pleasurably or without pleasure, actively or passively. Thus there is something within the individual that responds to the pressure of sensory perception and causes awareness to be immediately specialized into a series of judgments, conclusions, attitudes, and opinions. Yet this process occurring almost uh, too rapidly for us to estimate it still does not cause the individual to experience the fact of his own participation in awareness. Most persons, being aware of something, are not aware of their own faculty procedure. They merely accept things seen, assuming that this is a natural and normal procedure. It is only after the rise of man's philosophic life when he began to question the methodology of things that happened to him that he began to get frustrated over the problem of his own awareness. Prior to this time, he simply was glad that he had this awareness. Gradually, however, the problem of trying to understand it intrigued his mind, intrigued his reason. Now, why should man wish to know how and why he is aware? Probably the answer lies in the gradual arising in human nature of certain doubts. From early time, man became aware of the fallibility of his own judgments. He realized that he could be mistaken that due to the pressure of some psychic factor within himself, he could not depend upon the validity of his own sensory perception. He learned that he had a power by which he could pervert things seen or things heard, whereby he could interpret into something that which was not in it or interpret out of it something that was in it. Therefore, that this process of awareness was not necessarily valid. When he began to experience this, he began to experience the need to rationalize this awareness process to discover, if possible, where his own mistakes were. He began to realize also that he could not depend upon the sensory perception 
for final judgment in important problems. He could believe, as the ancients did, that the sun moved around the earth because it appeared to do so, and that when it set in the evening it went under the earth to light the world of the dead. He had a good deal of phenomenal evidence to sustain him, but he learned gradually that his senses were wrong, that what he appeared to see was not the truth. He learned in many ways that appearances could be deceptive, and by degrees he lost faith in the absolute validity of the initial impact of awareness. <coughs> he became aware, for example, that people who looked nice and were well-dressed could still cheat him. He discovered that individuals who looked very healthy could drop dead five minutes later. He discovered that what appeared to be a great bargain was wonderful only on the surface, and that appearances could prove very deceiving. He began to become suspicious of surfaces and of appearances, and sought stronger and more positive instruments by which he could judge value. The moment he began to search for the judgment about value, he discovered he had to use certain internal faculties that he had to weigh and ponder and consider. And he gradually divided his mental life into two parts, a concrete or objective mental life dealing principally with phenomena, and an abstract or subjective mental life that dealt almost totally with principles. Now, principles by themselves were difficult to deal with. A man has never succeeded in dealing with a pure principle. He has never been able to separate a value completely from association with objectivity. If you wish to, for example, try to estimate in your own inner awareness the nature of a completely honest person. Now you're out after a quality. You're out after the quality of honesty. You want to construct for your own purpose an archetypal image of total honesty. It is utterly impossible for you to do so without some recourse to objective symbolism. Man primitive in his thinking first decided that his way to discover the honest man was to find one somewhere in the world around him and then use this person as a pattern for all other honesty. We have done the same thing in religion. We have taken the one good man and made him the archetype of an ideal humanity. We have taken one virtuous person and called his way of life virtue. We have taken him gradually out of it, but we have never lost sight of the example which he gave, which becomes the standard for the estimation of an abstract value. Thus, our search for honesty had to center in the honest man. Our search for truth had to be uh, centered in a person who seemingly possessed this power or this invaluable treasure to a pronounced and outstanding degree. Truth without a truthful person or a truthful situation became comparatively unthinkable. So we were never able to completely get away from our dependency upon the records that our awareness had brought to us. Today, when we think of good as a virtue or as a quality, we must associate it with good persons, good conditions. We say that something fortunate that occurs to us is good. We must tie it 
with some phenomenal thing. Thus, as psychology has pointed out, we are not yet in a position to say that what we call consciousness is an arbitrary something within us which judges all other things. We are not able to say that consciousness is something in us forever judging righteous judgment. We would like to say that it is, but we are not able to prove this, either in our own living or by recourse to the compound example of life around us. We must, in absolute uh, honesty, therefore, say that consciousness as awareness is an awareness capable of error, an awareness which merely is awareness, but is not able to pass final judgment upon the qualities of which it is aware. Now this brings us to what you might almost call your Scottish metaphysical position on this, namely that consciousness per se and substantially represents the divine in man. That consciousness is a God-given attribute, inscrutable because it is divine, beyond definition because it is a spiritual thing, utterly transcending any of our objective or material experiences. Now this uh, causes also a moment of pause, because we know that we are now in the presence of a serious dilemma. If consciousness is inevitably divine, then we must explain the margin of error which we find in it, because we are not able to assume that there is a margin of error in the consciousness of God. Consequently, if consciousness is inaccurate, if man can come to certain conscious conclusions which are not true, then consciousness cannot be totally and completely divine. Because if it is, we associate it inevitably with the element of the infallible. And every aspect of consciousness that man knows today is fallible. We know, for example, that the noblest aspects of consciousness as we know them will be subject to modification in the future. And things which today we disregard or upon which we pass adverse judgment may sometimes be accepted as superior to what we have now or what we now accept. Thus consciousness cannot be more or nor less than a conditioned kind of awareness. Now what religion is really trying to tell us is that we actually have no definition or no true and complete explanation for this fact that we are aware. Once we become aware, we can assume that our awareness is subject to error imposed upon it by mind and sense. Thus the awareness of man recording any phenomenon may be subject to error due to false or inaccurate recording the sensory perception was not correct or not complete in its testimony. This can and does still leave the root of awareness as an energy or as a power, a kind of spiritual electricity, a kind of light essence by which awareness is possible. Religion might well affirm that this life essence, prior to its entanglement in judgment, or prior to its extension in awareness, may be regarded as a sacred or divine element or agent 
in the compound of man. Science today, striving to work this problem out, has had a number of hypotheses with which it has toyed at least uh, for a time. One of these concepts is that actually consciousness is a byproduct of body. That in some way consciousness arises within body. That it is due to the chemistry of the kind of creature that we are. And that no other kind of creature could have our kind of consciousness. Now if this is true, however, and consciousness arises from a complete chemistry of the body, then it would naturally follow that any major change in the body would alter consciousness, and this is not true. Therefore, we are forced to pause in this thought. In the war, the late World War, there were men who lost both arms and both legs the total amount of the body actually lost being nearly 50%. Yet there is no evidence that their consciousness changed in any way. It did not mean that they recognized any major change in themselves as centers of awareness. They were naturally handicapped and perhaps mentally and emotionally most disturbed. But actually they did not change basic consciousness. Also, it has been noted that consciousness is removed from any area of the body that is separated from the circulation of the central nervous system. Therefore, that in some mysterious way, consciousness moves in and through the body by means of the central nervous system. Therefore, if consciousness be regarded as an attribute of body, then the chemistry or alchemy must take place within the central nervous system so that the bodily contributions pass through certain changes and refinements or reorganizations in these areas before they can be regarded as the ground of a conscious reaction. In the last ten years, the problem has changed its complexion again. We have less emphasis upon consciousness as byproduct of biological function. We are again beginning to think of consciousness as something imposed upon body, something separate from and superior to body, either arising in a psychic field, which is an overtone of body, or else in a soul sphere, which is an undertone of spirit and is itself superior to body. All these theories and problems and postulations have their strong advocates, but an advocate does not necessarily possess the full answer. So this evening and through the rest of this series of lectures, we are going to try to summarize and explore the field of consciousness as it is understood in both Eastern and Western religion and philosophy, and as far as we can in the terms of psychology and in comparative standards which have arisen over the last several thousands of years of human intellectual contemplation. We can then begin with one of the most basic concepts that we have, and that is consciousness as a subject of its own object. Consciousness was to most ancient people regarded as subject, therefore identified with self, or identified with I. Consequently, in seeking for early definitions of consciousness, it was customary to associate this power with the existence of a selfness or even a selfhood within the composition of man. 
Consciousness then became the primary attribute of self. I am, being perhaps one of the simplest, the most ultimate statements of consciousness, and a statement which has gone unchallenged for the most part through the ages, because no one has sensed or felt the audacity to say, I am not. It sounds very defeating, frustrating, and difficult to demonstrate because the very statement of the individual that he is not implies that there is something that is in the position to make the statement which it immediately nullifies because the statement cannot emerge from that which is not. The man can deny, but in his very denial he proves that which he seeks to deny because he must use his own statement to deny his own existence. This becomes illogical, and primitive man, even at an early time, was not that foolish. He outgrew this uh, situation rather quickly. So he came to the conclusion that in some mysterious way, consciousness was man's statement of his own existence. That the man knew that he existed. And the mere fact that he knew that he existed was the primary proof of consciousness. How he knew, what he knew, why he knew, these questions have never been answered. But that he knew became a self-apparent fact against which there seemed to be no possible attack. The individual attempting to demonstrate his own lack of self-existence, found that it was impossible to make a demonstration without making use of the very elements which he sought to deny, so he was forced to give it up. We find in religious writings, therefore, quite frequently some simple statements such as I am. And uh, we find this in the story of the visit of Moses to the court of Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, when Moses and Aaron wanted to have the authority to appear, they wanted to know who had authorized them to go before Pharaoh. And God answered to them, Tell Pharaoh, I am hath sent thee. I am being primarily, therefore, a statement of divinity. This I am-ness allowed man to remain for a very long time simply basking in the fact of his own existence. The fact that he existed, however, rapidly led him into complications. As this sense of I am-ness began to develop, Man could not sense his own selfness except by the creation of a dynamic comparison. I am implies also the inevitable existence of that which is not I. I am makes a little wall around something which we call ourselves and gives to this which is within the wall a peculiarity different from that which is outside of the wall. Therefore the individual can turn toward himself and he can say, I am. He can turn away from himself and observe anything else in the universe and say, this is not I. So man developed a universe in which all things ultimately resolve themselves into two groups, I and not I. I was a very small group, consisting of one unit only. The not I was everything else that existed. Therefore, we may say that the not I was in an overwhelming preponderance. Also, this recognition 
of the I and the not I led to a further complication, namely that man could not and did not live by I alone. If the individual could have lived totally from within I, being an entirely self-sustaining creature, if he could have fed himself from within himself, clothed himself, if he could have reproduced his kind alone and without a reaction from any other creature, if he could have created his own empire for one being and one being only, and have lived without any dependence whatever upon nature around him, he might have gone on in blissful indifference to the not I forever. But he could not do this, and he came upon another dilemma, namely that in his experience, nearly everything that he wanted, everything that he needed, everything necessary to his survival belonged in the world of not I. He had to go out and cut down a tree when he wanted to, some wood. The tree was not I. He went fishing and he caught a fish which was not I. He then ate the fish, and then some one thing happened, and the fish became a vital factor in the perpetuation of the eye. The bones, however, he threw away. They were still not I. He had a family. He was very fond of his family in a primitive manner, whatever that might be. But that family was not I. And he gradually discovered also that the most difficult and terrible interval that exists in nature is the interval between two creatures with the same kind of eye. He didn't have nearly as much trouble understanding animals because he thought of them the way he wanted to and if he was wrong they could never correct him so he thought he got along very well. But the moment he tried to explain another eye, another self, he found himself in conflict with a being like himself, with purposes and principles which might not agree with his own. So man struggling against this not I discovered that himself as subject was under the almost continuous tyranny of his not self or the world around him as object. And we find this arising not more distantly than in our evening paper tonight. For we discover in reading the paper that there are many things happening in the world that we do not like. If we had anything about us to say about it, they wouldn't happen, according to our way of thinking. We feel, however, that these things are being caused by not I, by somebody else and that as sure as we are here, we must suffer from the happening and the doing of some other I that is not ourselves. Thus we have gradually grown to the position where we are all the victims of the collective objective, the thing outside of ourselves, and remain as passive observers, having a continuous awareness that things around us are going contrary to our inclinations and that there is nothing we can do about it. This is a, a rather confusing and uh, crippling type of recognition. Man had it for a long time, however. This is not new with us, though it is new every time it happens. We have then man as self looking around him into a world in which most of the values are very difficult for him to understand, and most of these difficulties arise from the action of other selves than his own. He may abstractly conceive the fact that for everyone else he is also one of those other selves and that therefore and the universe is composed of an infinite number of selves, each one unique to the one who it belongs to, each one almost impossible of comprehension by anything except itself. 
This curious psychological situation has always been a cause of difficulty and probably always will be as long as it continues because it places the human being in a strange relationship, a fatalistic, frustrating relationship with everything else that exists. Consciousness begins to tell us these things as we use it in terms of awareness. We therefore come to the conclusion that consciousness is in some way a rather individual thing. That consciousness has to be the sum or substance of something. So we then go to the next step, namely the possibility that behind each of the forms in nature there is a separate conscious entity. The moment we do this, we come into religion. For now we find the body to be possessed by a spirit or occupied by a conscious being that has an existence of its own apart from body, but is brought into a relationship with body during the phenomenon which we call physical living. We now have, then, conscious beings who have dispositions, characteristics, and attitudes which they impose upon body. Body then now becomes the victim of spirit or of the spiritual entity. The psychic being becomes the autocrat. Instead of body creating consciousness, body becomes merely the instrument for the expression of consciousness whether this consciousness be good or bad, depending upon the nature of the being which inhabits the body. Now what do we have in, in support of this concept? We have one thing that seemingly is very powerful, and that is this ultra-individuality this ultra of cells, this apparent hopeless separateness of cells. This situation that we see around us, that we are not understood by others, that the purposes sacred to us are meaningless to others, that basically we have great difficulty understanding and just as great difficulty being understood by any other being. Under such conditions, it seems that we can demonstrate that consciousness is a series of individual units, each one encased in some kind of form or body, and that these individual units are irreconcilable in themselves, having different origins and different destinies. This seems, uh, from a phenomenal standpoint, uh, reasonably conclusive, but it presents us with another rather abstract but important dilemma, and that is that we observe everywhere in nature that things in their ultimate states are not separate. We recognize, for example, that this solar system of ours is all to a great degree bound under the luminosity and energy of one sun. That this one sun or one light or one life illumines all things, sustains them, nourishes them, and is present in their compound. If this be true, we see in the power of the sun one life light susceptible of infinite differentiation. We know that the energy from the sun not only moves the planet, and causes the grass to grow, and inspires the poet and the mystic, but also sustains the worm and the insect, and makes the earth fertile, makes the very water that we drink suitable for our use. Thus this life, though infinitely separate in its manifestation, appears to us to be one essential substance. Man contemplating on this in the golden age of philosophy 
came to the conclusion that the life in man must be essentially one substance on the simple, empiric, logical premise that there cannot be more than one life, because life is not a separate thing, but a total and inclusive thing. There can be many living things, but life is the common denominator of all of them. Therefore, life is a universal, even though living may be a particular experience. Thus the ancient, contemplating this, came to the conclusion that as life is able to support many things in no way resembling each other, and at the same time certainly not resembling life itself, which is totally invisible in its own essence, so consciousness can be one thing although it is manifested as many different things with apparently little similarity and with the same attribute that life possesses, namely that in its substance it is invisible. Thus consciousness is one kind of energy, itself never to be experienced totally apart from involvement of some kind in a conditioning or modifying agent. That it is conceivable that my life might ultimately be experienced apart from form, this cannot be denied. But such experience is not yet available to us as the basis for the estimation of value. So philosophy advised us to contemplate that while consciousness, as it relates to our personal life, is a highly individual thing, that it is sustained by a common energy, which is the root and source of it, and that this is a universal thing, but that while man in particular may be conscious of many things, he has no facility and no power by means of which he can be conscious of conscious life in itself, apart from any modification or form which it may assume. Out of this type of thinking, perhaps, develop the theories of yoga and Vedanta, these theories being very largely based upon the recognition of a common universality of life. And therefore, that behind all individuality, all personality, all separateness, there has to be one common energy. And that this common energy is actually a most uncommon energy, inasmuch as it is the pure energy of divinity itself. This, of course, led from a concept immediately to a precept. And Vedanta developed along the idea that having affirmed the existence of a transcendent universal energy, in this case a universal energy consciousness, uh, that it was the privilege, duty, and responsibility of the human being to so integrate or organize his own resources that he could become increasingly conscious of this universal agent. That he therefore made his own way of life uh, to achieve a universal experience of consciousness. Now this universal experience of consciousness, the modern psychologist warns us, is not quite as simple as religion might make it seem to be. Because actually, how are we going to discover the validity of our own mood? Supposing the individual actually has what he regards as a genuine experience of cosmic consciousness. How does he know that it is cosmic consciousness? By what comparison, or by what value within himself, is he able to judge the merit of any extension of his own consciousness beyond his own experience? This becomes a very difficult question. 
we may have an experience which seems to us transcendent. How transcendent is it? We may feel that at any given moment that we have been elevated into a universality. Have we? Or are we merely drawing upon our own symbolism and simply projecting a mental image of a state, a state which has become familiar to us through reading, through thought, through study, or through contact with some outstanding system of religion or ethics. I know, for example, that we all have studied uh, what you might term consciousness dreams, dreams in which the individual appears to move into a superior state of consciousness from that of his daily living. He feels quite certain that he has entered into spheres of reality, transcending anything that he knows here. But has he actually entered them? Or has he merely visualized conditions that he has hoped would exist or could exist? Has he actually escaped the tyranny of his own mind? Or has he merely come under the more subtle influences of that tyranny, therefore a worse victim than before? This is hard to say without a very careful analysis of a particular incident under discussion. But it is a well-known fact that the individual can create a mirage, move into it, feel himself to have had extraordinary extension of consciousness when in reality he has only intensely visualized certain mental patterns which he has previously experienced and accepted. All this causes us to be to a measure careful in our estimation of what this consciousness experience can actually mean to us. We have to be very thoughtful, very wise, not allow ourselves to become too optimistic in our examination of these factors. The uh, fact still remains then that we are aware and that this awareness troubles us to the degree that we try to understand how we are aware, are aware and why. And perhaps uh, in going into this the situation as thoughtfully as we can, there is another approach that might be worthwhile. And that is the approach of the mystic. And the mystic seeking to discover consciousness tries to do so by suspending the function of everything that is not consciousness. He does not attempt to storm the gates of heaven. He does not attempt to push his own mind or his own convictions into the world of causes. He does not attempt to dictate to the universe as to how it exists or what it is like nor to impose any concept of his own upon universals. He takes the attitude that if he imposes no concept, if he suspends all of his own personal attitude, that which remains will form a kind of door by means of which the impersonal at the root of himself may come through into manifestation. In other words, that if he can prevent illusion, prevent himself from distorting his own mind, prevent himself from allowing the mind to dominate his spiritual convictions, that in this way, by suspending mind, he can come into the direct presence of consciousness itself. But the thing that blocks consciousness in man is mental activity. The ancients assumed, of course, that two things blocked it, mental activity and emotional activity. That wherever the individual was under mental or emotional pressure, he would never be honest, he could never see anything as it truly is, and he could never be still and permit the internal to move through him. 
Thus the Quaker, the Quietist, the Sufi, all of these types of mystics uh, assume that consciousness could best be experienced or discovered through the total suspension of all function. And this was to a measure behind the meditative disciplines of Eastern religion, as well as the monastic disciplines of the Western Church. Out of this experience, however, came a series of consequences which also have to be estimated in terms of value. One thing we do know, namely that the suspension of the objective faculties of the individual certainly did have a particular and definite result. And that result was a distinct ennobling of his nature. The individual who was able to suspend his own selfishness, for example, exhibited a larger measure of unselfishness. The individual who was able to suspend worry found greater internal organization. Therefore, we can say that the person who is able to suspend negative processes in his own psychic life certainly gains a considerable amount of insight or releases a superior quality of insight as the result of escaping from or overcoming negative or lesser degrees of insight. Thus, in the uh, experience of the mystic, there seemed to be an increasing godliness an increasing sensitivity to value as the individual slowly relinquished uh, those attitudes which were most likely to bind him to false concepts and standards. Here we have then perhaps the explanation throughout the whole world of what we might term the, the mendicant attitude in religion. Namely that man not being able to serve two masters those seeking God must first renounce the world. This renouncing the world was only symbolic, however. It was the renouncing of the entanglement in which the sensory perceptions attaching themselves to objects became hopelessly involved in these objects and in the destinies of these objects to the degree that there was no longer any possibility of attaining, attaining a tranquility because of the non-tranquil nature of attachments. Attachments are always subject to improvement or to lack or loss of improved condition. They go forward or backward. The individual either becomes more or less. And these attachments never seem to stand still. And the individual captured in the moods and constant motions of these attachments must also bear their commotion and the confusions which arise within them. So the mystic simply takes the attitude that if you can suspend worldliness, that which, that which you have left is God consciousness. But the individual who has no consciousness of his own, by that very fact, becomes aware of universal consciousness. That universal consciousness and human consciousness have a common root, but that the one cannot be manifested, the universal, until the other, the personal, has been suspended. This again is the idea that man cannot serve two masters. Therefore, he cannot serve both the mind and the consciousness. He cannot serve the ego and God. And somewhere he must make the decision. And if he decides to serve truth, then he must gradually detach his awareness from all these pressures which cause illusion or have a tendency to result in the distortion of the testimonies of sensory perception. Uh, the story we have of Dante and his contemplation of the city of Florence uh, follows in this thinking also. Namely, that the mystic, having impersonalized his faculties, 
is able to perceive all things in a more universal way. He is no longer concerned with friend or enemy. He is no longer concerned with wealth or poverty, youth or age, attachment or loss. And being free from these pressures, he seems to gain a kind of tranquility, a suspension of pressures. And this suspension of pressure has always been an essential part of the phenomenon of mysticism. But we then begin to say, what does this mean in terms of consciousness? It means a certain relaxation. It means that consciousness is no longer constantly moving. Awareness is no longer bombarding the center of itself with an endless stream of testimony. Western man, confronted with this problem, takes the attitude that to suspend these faculties, to suspend the pressures of living, will mean to reduce the consciousness itself to a non-entity. What he is trying to tell us is that the consciousness has no existence apart from stress, that it exists primarily because it is challenged, and that consciousness is man's reaction to challenge that it leads to the gradual strengthening of faculties and the intensification of energies, the development of the power of the will, and the gradual integration of resources against adversity. Therefore, that if we suspend the problems around man, we isolate him, and his consciousness simply goes to sleep because it is not challenged. That the consciousness, therefore, in man is something which rises primarily to challenge and has no existence apart from the need for itself which man experiences in daily living. This, however, is not quite rational either. It is subject to a, is subject to a great deal of controversy and debate on a number of grounds. First, if consciousness is dependent upon phenomena, such as man's association with the immediate problems around him. And consciousness represents, as we have a tendency to believe that it represents, one of the highest existing forms of energy in space. Then it leaves universal consciousness dependent upon universal action and causes God to be totally dependent upon his creation for his own existence. This opens another question. It opens the problem as to whether the divine nature in this respect is identical with human nature. Man is dependent for certain experience upon his environment. Is this also true of deity? Is deity aware of its own existence only because of the struggle of creatures like human beings who must in some way uh, find the solution to their mystery and in so finding it do they contribute to the ultimate discovery of the mystery by deity itself? The ancients were disinclined to this viewpoint. They were more inclined to view uh, a middle attitude as one, perhaps, of greater accuracy. Admitting that consciousness is dependent in its manifestation upon phenomena, the ancient also affirmed that it has an existence and subsistence apart from phenomena. Therefore, that if the individual does nothing, in no way stirs mentation or emotion, suspends every faculty of observation and power that he possesses, that he does not in so doing uh, destroy consciousness or cause it to cease to exist or to cease to have a natural faculty of its own. The ancients were inclined to assume that consciousness has an existence in itself and that this, in, this existence in itself is perhaps the supreme mystery of all mysteries in the universe. So 
let us assume that man with personal consciousness becomes by means of it able to understand a personal world of particulars around him. Yet with this particular or personal consciousness, man is not capable of understanding universal mystery. Man is only able to totally understand on a level. And here is something that's rather important to bear in mind. The moment the individual ascends above his own norm, his power to understand slowly decreases. The moment he descends below his present norm, his power to understand also decreases. If, therefore, man contemplates any form of life essentially less than his own, he contemplates it with no more assurance than he contemplates a life superior to his own. Man is therefore locked on a level. We might say, for example, that man's body, containing within it all the working parts of his own elaborate economy, that man should be capable of the experience of the parts of his own body, but he is not. Man is utterly incapable of experiencing the problem of his own heart. He is not able to experience in participation the project or problem of the digestion of his own food. To him, the mystery of his own digestion must be studied out of a book as though it belonged to someone else. He cannot experience the process of his own digestion. The only time he can get a little taste of that kind of an experience is when he has indigestion. Then he discovers that he is aware of something. But even this awareness does not prevent him from making the same mistake that caused the indigestion. Man is aware of pain or discomfort, but he is not aware of process. He cannot be very quiet and very still and experience his own digestion. He cannot be very quiet and very still and experience what happens to a nerve within his own body. He, he must consider even his own body as something separate from himself, something that he must study. He has to go to school with others to study the structure of body in common before he is able to examine his own. Yet this body belongs to him, and its energies are sustained by his life, yet he cannot share in it. If he goes upward into a world of more rarefied conditions of consciousness, he cannot, by moving inward, discover the nature of his own ideas. He cannot actually experience his own ideals. He cannot contemplate a superior state of himself nor can he for one moment experience the consciousness of the orders or hierarchies which he believes are above himself in nature. It is very difficult for him to experience actually the wisdom of one of his own kind, slightly wiser than himself. And he certainly has difficulty in really appreciating one of his own kind who is a little more foolish than he is. He is locked within a very narrow gamut. And his consciousness thus simply does not escape either upward or downward under the normal functions of living. If, however, he enters into a state of contemplation and he detaches himself from all worldliness around him, trying to absorb himself into the most subtle parts of his own being, could he then become sensitive enough to experience the functions of his own body. Eastern yogas tell us that he can, but that requires a tremendous amount of discipline and a very highly developed science, and that also the to experience a state of awareness superior to his present state requires a very high advancement in the yogic art. But these things will not happen by accident. But, of course, they will all happen gradually by evolution over long periods of time because man is growing into new experience continuously.
But until he actually experiences these things, he cannot cope with them. And consciousness, as consciousness, does not fill this interval. It does not make it possible for him to do that which is otherwise impossible. But the potential of consciousness seems to possess within it the power to accept growth by experience, so that experience never outgrows consciousness, but becomes a new instrument for its manifestation on a higher level. All these factors then contribute to another point. Thinking of personal consciousness, the individual, following the old concept of microcosm-macrocosm analogies, which dominated thinking for a thousand years in Europe, became a habit, comes to the next conclusion. Is his own state of consciousness uh, a key to the relationships of universal consciousness? If, for example, man is personal, and the universe is bigger than man, and must support many men, many beings, many creatures, may we justly ascribe to the universe a universal consciousness, even as we ascribe to the person a personal consciousness. We may certainly do so. But when we divide consciousness from personal to universal, what do we experience in the process of so doing? Do we know any more than we did before? In the majority of cases, we do not. Universal consciousness simply becomes our consciousness applied or projected by ourselves toward a state which we have not experienced but which we must conclude is bigger than our state. Therefore, we come up with the idea that universal consciousness is greater. Because this universal consciousness is associated with God, it is better. Because deity is presumed to be all-knowing, this universal consciousness is omniscient. Because God is everywhere, this universal consciousness is omnipresent. And because God does all things, this universal consciousness is omniactive. But when we have said these things, what have we said? We have only tossed long words around. We have not actually experienced any of the factors involved. We have simply projected our own state upon the universe and assumed that as man has the awareness of self, within his own nature, that the universe is ruled by a being also possessing awareness of self. Awareness of self by man is called personal consciousness. Awareness of self by deity is called universal consciousness. Because deity, being the universe, being the totality of existence, self-awareness for deity implies total consciousness. Yet, self-awareness, as applied to man, does not imply personal total consciousness. We are to assume that deity, by its consciousness, is aware of the sparrow's fall. But man, with his world, by his personal consciousness, is not aware of the infirmities of his own flesh. He may sicken and die before even recognizing the symptoms. Man is not aware of the burden placed upon the blood vessels of his own body. He does not have to carry the load of the smallest cell as a conscious experience in his own life. Yet man as a person controls a body of which he is unaware and which he therefore frequently perverts to his own ambitions. Had he the consciousness of it, he would not do so. How then shall we affirm that universal consciousness is actually aware of us any more than we are aware of the cells within our body? We affirm these things, but we do not know them to be true. We also affirm them on the testimony of certain individuals who claim to have had certain experiences. We do not deny these experiences, 
but as long, until these experiences uh, can be so standardized that they can be examined by more than the handful of isolated witnesses, we cannot, on the other hand, totally accept without question findings about which we have inadequate information or substantial knowledge. We must keep many of these points in comparative suspension because we simply do not know. I have a feeling, however, that if we are to search for the answers to these things, and psychology is desperately seeking these answers today, perhaps more than ever before and in the future, probably even more avidly than now, that we have to recognize that consciousness, as we uh, wish to understand this, is more than merely universal cognition. I do not think that the actual definition of consciousness in terms of universal consciousness means universal cognition. I question if we will be able to supply evidence that consciousness is directly associated either with cognition or awareness. That these terms represent our effort to explain an aspect of consciousness rather than the total nature of consciousness itself. In all probabilities, consciousness is, as far as we are able to estimate, not consciousness. In this sense of the word, that consciousness is a kind of an infinite potential which is capable of infinite unfoldment from within its own root. But the root itself is so completely remote to our experience that we have no adequate way of defining it. This does not mean that consciousness does not exist but rather that what we know as existence is not enough to involve or enclose our concept of consciousness. Our word existence does not go far enough. No thought or term that we have goes far enough. No state of being that we can experience is close enough to consciousness to give us any clue to its essential nature. Perhaps the nearest clue that we have is this process of suspending a function that is not consciousness. But out of this suspension, for the most part, we arrive at a total suspension. We come into the presence of a timelessness, a beinglessness, in which, according to the testimonies of the ancients, and those who have experienced these things, we gradually lose sense of self-existence. That true samadhi, or true nirvana, as taught in Asia, is the complete suspension of the sense of self-existence. The individual reaches a state in which he is not aware. And furthermore, by this means, he also has reached a state in which he is no longer aware whether he is aware or not. The complete suspension of the state of knowing awareness. Therefore, in this instant, the individual escapes time and place totally. Consequently, what we call awareness is related to time-place association. We are aware of time and place, of the relationships of these things upon each other. Time, place, thing. All these are essential to awareness. The suspension of time, place, and thing causes the suspension of awareness. In that instant, man is unaware 
of his own existence or non-existence. So we study the problem as carefully as we can to discover, if we can, what the individual is cognizant of while he is not aware. Well, that's a pretty problem. <laughs> In other words, it's an extension of the idea of what is he thinking about when he's not thinking. In the samadhi and in the experiences of Eastern mystics, there is a peculiar term which comes in, which I don't think has been much discussed in the West, but except perhaps among some of your old medieval saints. And that is this reference to blessedness, reference to bliss, and to a state of almost perpetual ecstasy, which seems to mark the profound mystical apperceptive mood of uh, these saintly persons. Having transcended all personality, time, place, condition, there seems to be described a state of bliss, a state of timeless, measureless, beingless bliss. Now this uh, has been explained and studied a great deal, particularly in your Oriental philosophy, to find out how an individual can be so blissful when he doesn't know that he exists. <laughs> but he comes back with an answer which confounds the elders and leaves the entire situation in, the, in very much of a dilemma. Nature, namely, that bliss exists. That he has discovered that a condition exists, but he does not which is the exact reverse of everything we know. Are we then to affirm that consciousness in its own nature, a priori, is the exact reverse of everything that we know? Is consciousness the opposite of every definition we have ever given it? Is consciousness, therefore, by its very nature, completely contrary in substance to the extensions of itself in matter. Is anything that appears to be good at one pole bad at the other? And is this consciousness which we know as the continual urge to be aware, is true consciousness a complete suspension of awareness, presenting to us some dimension of the above awareness, beyond anything that we can conceive of, with our present faculties and our present knowledge. Buddha took the position that true consciousness was not only incomprehensible to us, but different from anything that we have ever experienced, and making use of a series of instrumentations which we have no awareness of, that true consciousness is not extinction, but can only be discovered by the total extinction of every process that we use to attempt to attain consciousness, inasmuch as every process that we use creates pressure, creates intensity, and builds a greater wall of illusion or misinterpretation around our awareness problem. So he took the simple answer that universal consciousness can never be known until it is experienced, and that when it is experienced, it is discovered to be perhaps what the mystic says, not the individual aware of something, but condition itself aware of the individual, that there is a positive polarity in space. And that true consciousness is the universal being aware of the particular. Whereas consciousness as we know it is man as a particular forever seeking awareness 
of universal, or that which is separate from himself. Man seeking to understand what is separate, whereas consciousness is forever moving through that which is not separate, but is the same. Consequently, true consciousness is the discovery of sameness, or the ex total experience of sameness. Whereas our type of consciousness, our analytical consciousness, is constant awareness of difference. Socrates and many of the Greek philosophers worked very hard on this problem of consciousness, although the term was not very well known to them as we use it today. In fact, the type of consciousness that we refer to was unknown to them because they had an entirely different attitude toward this entire subject. They held it to be self-evident among the uh, Greek idealistic uh, school that man was a stranger coming into this world, arriving here, having his internal psychic life drowned or intoxicated by matter, and that therefore he lived in this world in a kind of stupor from which he could only be released by discipline or by initiation into the mysteries. That if by virtue and integrity he lifted himself above the restrictions of his own body, gaining during life victory over his own senses, emotions, and desires, that he might then return again to the spiritual estate from which he had come. This concept was almost a complete pattern. Uh, the Greek mind did not go further than this, because it also dealt with the concept of metempsychosis, or rebirth, assuming that the individual would have to be reborn many times before the ultimates of consciousness were of any particular importance to him. This left the situation almost untouched, except that Socrates and most of the Greeks, including Pythagoras, pointed out clearly that the road to consciousness was the road to separation between worldly and divine matters, and that every individual seeking consciousness must attain this separation within himself, restoring to value those things which were valuable and relinquishing such attachments as might interfere with the ultimate victory of the soul over circumstances. Thus in the Greek we have the beginning of the idea that man must attain some kind of a victory over a natural habit or inclination before he could experience the true mystery of consciousness. In the East today, as in long ago, this consciousness problem presents itself in a variety of ways. Zen has one approach to it. Lao Tzu, in his Taoist teaching, had another approach to it. But all of these approaches have to do with certain things. One of the points always emphasized is discipline. Now how shall we understand discipline in relationship to consciousness? For example, how are we to assume that man's consciousness, being as it is more or less polluted by the condition under which he exists, placing upon him or making available to him a discipline superior to his own state? Yet we know this can happen in the ordinary life of man. We know that a man who has lived a corrupt existence, becoming aware of this fact, may place a resolution upon his own nature by which he is going to correct these faults of character and restore his integrity as a person. Thus man may, by perceiving those around him and being inspired by conduct superior to his own, or discovering that his own conduct is no longer suitable to his nature, may improve or change himself. Discipline implies this particular kind of adjustment. Uh, discipline is the mature person placing certain restraint upon his own conduct. One kind of discipline is called lawfulness. It has to do with social adjustment in which the individual restrains his conduct because certain conduct is dangerous and detrimental to society and opens him to punishment. There is another type of self-restraint which is posed upon the individual who has discovered that excess is dangerous to his own nature. 
He has discovered that unhappiness, misery, sorrow, pain, these things have arisen from his own conduct. Therefore, he is inspired and impelled to make certain changes within his nature. Go further into this same, apparel, this same policy and you come to your philosophic theory, namely that discipline philosophically imposed is man's recognition that it is possible for him to control his own faculties, that it is possible for him to impose upon his own nature certain rules suitable for the improvement of his own total being, and that uh, such may be termed discipline or penance or may be ap applied by an obligation or an oath or by a voluntary commission. All of these things ancient peoples understood and they made certain vows and they took certain rites by which they dedicated themselves to the better conduct of their own lives. So in uh, yoga and in most of the Eastern disciplines and in Christian monasticism, rules for the refinement of self were taught and were imposed upon those who desired certain as spiritual advancements. And I think that in the majority of instances these rules, though perhaps difficult, had a numerous uh, virtuous connotations. I think the loss and complete lack of self-discipline which has so distinguished our modern age is responsible for a large part of the trouble that we are now in. The individual failing to accept a responsibility to himself has lost the wonderful privilege of being stronger than his own desires. And lacking this experience, he has been unable to meet adversity with the strength and courage and dedication of which perhaps was present in civilizations less advanced technologically than ours. So that the possibility of self-discipline as in Zen or in uh, Taoism must be given due consideration. Self-discipline in terms of consciousness is the individual assuming that there is a life within him that is part of a universal life and that this life is by substance and nature either greater than the common life of the person or else in potential is capable of greater advancement or of being able to support more adequately the improvement of the individual if he will make an effort in that direction. So the, uh, the disciplines of consciousness assume that there is something in man which is capable of a better knowing of things, a better acceptance, a better understanding or appreciation than that which is commonly available. Ancient man then began to study modern metaphysics followed in the same general pattern. The effect of the mind upon the man and have come to the conclusion that the mind, as the uh, Indian classic, the Gita says, can be and frequently is the slayer of the real. That man's mind, setting upon him certain personal patterns and habits, causes him to develop a kind of characteristic or a false kind of personality or temperament and that the findings of this false temperament pass as findings of consciousness when they are not and that when the individual says I he is usually not referring to his center of consciousness but to his intellectual egoism. That when he says, I think, he is not stating the truth. He is saying what he says without consideration. For what he means is, the mind thinks. And instead of the mind being used to think by the I, the mind is its own master and is imposing its own requirements upon the self. Therefore, the, as Buddha points out, the individual says, I want. This is a lie except in one particular. Buddha says that man can say, I want, 
only in one way and make it honest. And that is that I want liberation. That any other desire except complete spiritual emancipation is not a desire of the I. Therefore, that the I does not want. The individual says, I like. Buddha says this is a lie. It is only applicable under one condition when the individual declares a fondness or likeness for absolute truth. That nothing else arises from a proper level to say, I like, I want. I believe. To say I possess is false. And if there is a consciousness in man, this statement is an absolute contradiction to that consciousness. To say I possess is a false statement. Because I cannot possess. The only thing that can possess is my body. And to say I possess means that I assume that my body is I. To say I want is to assume that my emotions are I. To say that I believe means to assume that my mind is I. To say I think is to assume that the thinker is the self. And these assumptions are not true. Therefore, the terms that we commonly use and with which we are continually fortifying our own psychology, these terms are false. The longer we become addicted to them and the more strenuously we observe them, the more completely confused that we will become. And this has apparently been true because we have finally reached the pinnacle of all confusion. There is no way in which we can estimate greater confusion than, than that we have now except by waiting until tomorrow. <laughs> then we will have a new experience of how much worse it could get. But now we have reached the apex of the conceivable. But actually, consciousness is none of these things. Consciousness impels none of these thoughts. Because in the substance of consciousness, they are useless. <coughs> Actually, everything that the individual does, he does for one of two purposes, one positive and the other negative. Everything he is doing is either in order that he may approach reality or that he may depart from unreality. Everything we do, we do in order that we shall be more happy or less unhappy that we shall be more popular or less unpopular, more successful or less unsuccessful. Everything is either a positive or negative effort to move from an unsatisfactory condition to one that is satisfactory. How then can consciousness, which is total satisfaction, have any motion in it, whatever? How can consciousness be escaping from anything or desiring anything? How can consciousness desire to be more than it is or to have anything that it does not possess? Avalok Ellis points this out in his mystical experience description, that in this transcendent moment he was desireless, that he lived in a, or existed in a state of such complete adjustment with existence that he realized that there was nothing missing. Nothing could be added. Nothing could be taken away. Therefore, everything for which we exist, which is to add or to take away, must cease to be significant. And the motivations that move all of us become non-operative. <coughs> what is man, therefore, to do when all of his familiar motivations cease to motivate him? He apparently is suspended in nothing. But actually, in that state of suspension, he is for the first time at the end of a journey through unsatisfaction toward something. 
Now we do not assume and cannot take for granted even for a moment that the universe ends in a stasis. That all dynamic is eternal, we are reasonably certain. That forms and types of motion and energy can constantly change, we know. But that energy itself can cease, we gravely doubt. We know that it may be subject to modification, that it may pass into forms beyond our comprehension or conception, but that it shall cease once it moves is beyond our certainty at least. Therefore, we have no reason to assume that man ends in a suspension of a heavenly state of bliss which leaves nothing to be desired and permits nothing to be present that is not desired. This would be a complete suspension, a complete end of everything. What we are therefore probably dealing with is that we are bringing the individual out of the well, at the bottom of which he has been existing, as in Plato's legend and fable of the well, that what we call nirvana, or the total extinction of man's escape and defense patterns, is actually the release of man's consciousness as fact. And therefore, at that time, at that time only, is the truth available, inasmuch as error has ceased. That actually, under those conditions, man passes from a prenatal state, which is the one he's in now, into a condition of birth, being born out of ignorance into a state of reality that that state of reality is therefore comparable to our concept of consciousness. But under the present condition we are simply unaware of it, being no more able to remember or recognize it than we are to remember our state before birth. Yet that we had a state, we know. What it was, we do not know. That we have a state beyond us in the future, Superior to our present, we are convinced by instinct within us. What it is, we do not know. But we can only assume that it is more than the absence of itself. That whatever is less perfect is moving towards a condition superior to its own state. We do not wish, however, to be caught in the thought that the pushing of the present condition into the future makes it perfect nor that the complete satisfaction of any pattern that we now hold means security. What we are trying to achieve is the realization that there is an integrity, whether we know it or not, like it or not, believe it or not, accept it or not, and that it is toward that integrity we are moving, and that that integrity may or may not agree with anything we now believe but that we are approaching it by trial and error regardless of any other efforts that we make. And your disciplines imply that it can be approached by discipline also. Discipline merely being the exhaustion of error by character rather than by accident. Under these conditions, man is capable, perhaps, of so suspending error in his own thinking and in his own formula that he is capable of the experience of consciousness, that he will be able to experience it completely in body is unlikely, but that he can experience a shadow of it, a sensing of what lies beyond it is conceivable if he performs these disciplines and follows in the footsteps of those who have led the way to these supernormal experiences of awareness. That brings us then to the next step in our problem. What is the difference between universal consciousness and universal mind? Universal mind, apparently, has always been held as a demiurgus or as a secondary deity. The universe brought into existence as a mystery of consciousness. Therefore, creative, creatively engendered by consciousness which is creative 
and creativity is the principal difference between consciousness and intellect. Intellect is not creative, consciousness is. Wherever intellect seems to create, it is because of consciousness content that is behind or operating in pattern with intellect. But universal mind becomes the regulator, the administrator of the world of, in which man exists. It was therefore sometimes referred to as the third logos. It is the world, mind, or intellect, the imposer of regulation, rule, and statute. And the world under its intellect becomes a rational animal moving in space. Plato so defined the world. When the, the Greeks referred to the world, they referred to what we would call the solar system or perhaps even the universe in some of the connotations that they had of the term. So the world as a mental entity is a mental autocracy in space. Even as man, as a thinking or mental creature, is a self-governing unit, governed by reason, intellect, or mind governed according to the quality and capacity of individual and collective intellect. The mind, in turn, deriving its authority, substance, essence, and energy from world mind. Man with mind can become the thinker, but mind has never yet satisfied the inclination of man in his search for truth. The mind is not capable of the experience of truth. The nearest that it can come to it is the organization of reasonable facts. Therefore, the mind can discover the reasonable. The emotions can discover the good. But only consciousness abides in the substance of the real. And reality is beyond uh, that which is either reasonable or good. The reasonable may be only reasonable in terms of relativity. The good may be good only in terms of relativity. But the real is unchanging as the root behind all change and phenomena. Therefore, in classical thinking, consciousness is associated with reality. And that being is said to be conscious, which is capable to, of apperceiving reality. And that being is considered to be enlightened whose true nature is regulated by the reality locked within itself. This reality is not mental, but man has created a false reality which he has imposed upon himself. And perhaps the false reality which he has imposed is best exemplified in his materialistic culture. For in materialism he has established a world ruled over by the concrete faculties of the mind, which have become a despot, a despot of realism on a material level. Realism as opposed to reality, where they are not the same thing. Materialism, rationalized, has become our way of life, and it is also promising or threatening to become our way of death. This uh, carries with it the ancient belief that consciousness differs, therefore, from reason in its experience factor and in its creativity. A thing thought out is not a thing lived through. Thought is a kind of vicarious laboratory process. The individual can think about many things which he has not experienced and will not experience because he can read about them and think about his own thoughts. Consciousness, however, is rooted in an experienced reality. It is rooted in the individual's power to say, I know, without exaggeration. The power to know is not the power of reason. 
The power to know is a sensitive field within the individual which either can receive the total impact of a fact or else is capable of so energizing its own nature that it can discover the fact in things around itself. Therefore the question has been asked and perhaps with validity. Is the difference between objectivity and subjectivity in this sense that error is the result of external things moving in upon the individual and reality the result of the individual moving out upon things. This could be a valid comparison if we do not push it too far. I think there is no doubt in the world that consciousness discovers value in things, and that it does so by an intentional purpose, that consciousness coming in where intellectual intellection ceases, searches for that which the intellect cannot find. Intellect, for example, can discover character and motive. Consciousness, however, seeking reality seeks the experience which led the individual to his conduct. And as we go further and further in this, we discover that the mind judges, but consciousness does not. That in some mysterious way, we refine the same thought that Jesus gave to his disciples. The mind says, judge righteous judgment. Consciousness says, judge not at all. For with whatsoever measure ye judge, so shall it be judged unto you. Condemn not, lest ye be condemned. In other words, mind passes judgment, consciousness suspends judgment. And there is a constant situation. This suspension is not due to the individual merely following the rule not to judge. Consciousness in some way takes the edge out of judging. It takes the pleasure out of judging. It lifts the individual from the mental uh, exercise of the either-or Aristotelian mode and causes the intuitive recognition of value so deep that the individual no longer feels qualified to judge. Therefore, the persons with least mind have most fixed opinions, whereas those whose knowledge is greater hesitate to express an opinion, simply because the more they know, the more aware they are of what they do not know, and how much more there may be to any problem that they can possibly perceive. Thus, as consciousness increases, man's immediate mental certainties decrease. Now, you can have a mental bigot, but you cannot have a bigot in consciousness. Because consciousness is a thing in itself impersonal. And bigotry has to be intensely personal. So wherever we contact consciousness as we know it, or as we perceive or believe it, we observe one thing, that there has been a great motion of humanity. We come back to Bacon's concept of observation as one of the basic instruments of knowing. There has been a great motion of mankind from the beginning of time, a motion in which man has sought to discover reality as it is referable to himself. We have observed also that in this motion certain individuals, certain times, beliefs, attitudes, doctrines have come forth, and that down through time we have gradually come to most admire, most deeply revere and regard, respect and consider as admirable persons with certain attitudes. We have also gradually come to observe that persons with those attitudes have been vindicated by history, that with the gradual passing of time, these persons have been proved right whereas those with different or other attitudes have not been proved right. 
Thus we have a certain experience framework to indicate the correct or general motion of man's awareness. We know in general the kind of awareness that has made better people. We know the kind of awareness that has enriched cultures and has given us all that we have of nobility and beauty and truth. We know the kind of awareness that survives death and causes persons to be discovered, honored, and revered centuries after they are gone. We also find that this kind of awareness is seldom accepted by their contemporaries, and that whereas those popular in their own day have disappeared or been forgotten, those clinging to certain broad, unchanging patterns have been remembered after their own time, and still are remembered and that among those with certain attitudes, the immortals of our remembrance have been selected, and that these persons continue to influence the world and have always influenced, since their own time, at least certain groups. We know, for example, that Plato is read today a million times more than in his own day whereas many great names of his time are not even remembered to us. Thus certain types of thinking have not only moved individuals, but have contributed to the permanent motion of peoples, of cultures, have led to the gradual building of sciences, for upon certain foundations that must have been true, the sciences that we have gradually developed were developed. Had they been essentially false, we could not have built upon them. So there are attitudes, there are beliefs, there are teachings that have survived simply because of a strange integrity locked within them. These patterns give us some concept of what constitutes the direction in which man is presumed to be moving. We know that such consciousness as this, such attitudes as this, are exemplified by the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus, uh, by the words of the prophets of ancient Israel, by the wonderful discourse of Muhammad at Mecca, also by the first sermon of Buddha, seated at Sarnath, along the side of the Indian road, and in the wonderful uh, works of Confucius and Lao Tzu, that these have all struck certain identical chords and that man has instinctively known that these were right, regardless of how he conducted himself. Thus, out of this, we have a direction of consciousness. We know that this direction has caused us, for some reason, to admire most those who, forsaking all other things, have clung to truth and those departing from all personal or selfish ends have dedicated themselves to the common service of their fellow men. These persons have lived. Therefore, the search for consciousness or the experience of consciousness is bound into this pattern so far as we are able to understand it. And if there is a way toward consciousness for man, it is in this way of gradually decreasing selfishness, decreasing personal ambition and the gradual elevation of universal value above personal value, that such a compromise of position, that such a change from our common pattern, has caused great sorrow and misery to these people, we know. Yet in themselves they were greater than their sorrow or their misery, and out of them has come historic martyrdom, individuals, who were perfectly willing and gloriously ready to sacrifice their lives to protect others or to preserve principles and convictions which they regarded as greater than life. Thus we find the evidences of the courage, internal resource, and strength bestowed by certain convictions as opposed to the common weaknesses resulting from certain other convictions. From these broad factors, we must finally come to the conclusion that man has accepted subconsciously, whether consciously or not, 
has accepted subconsciously that there is a consciousness superior to intellect, that this consciousness has an existence apart from intellect, that this consciousness is impersonal, universal, and in its essential ideals and principles, seeks to bind up all differences, unite all discords, and reflect or reveal the common unity within life and living. That this consciousness has to do with the mending of broken things, the overcoming of all separateness, man's outgrowth of egoism, selfishness, ignorance, and superstition, <coughs> and that within man is the vision of this need, and uh, that discipline comes to him as he gradually clarifies this position and seeks to gain the strength of internal resource available to him once he begins to move in harmony with it. And the search for consciousness for man today seems to be the result of a dedication by which he resolves to move himself with consciousness toward consciousness, and dedicates himself to those ends which, to the best of his conviction, represent the proper and natural ends of consciousness, as differentiated from the intellectual and emotional ends which he has previously cultivated and which have led to discord and disaster. So we have this experience of consciousness, with man seeking to do those things which man's universal experience has demonstrated to be right, does gain greater courage, greater insight, and greater internal strength. And from these circumstances, may assume that at this present stage of his growth, this is the direction which it is proper for him to take, and that therefore he gains the support of consciousness by dedicating himself to those universal values which he senses within himself, and which, if they have any origin at all, certainly originate in consciousness, rather than in the selfish, separating factors of his ordinary existence. So the individual dedicating himself to his superordinary self, to that which is beyond his common, daily purposed self, finds that he gains greater strength, and greater ability, greater respect and honor, and achieves greater good. For these reasons, he assumes that such motion on his part is motion toward consciousness, or with the approval of consciousness, and that he is rewarded by the release of greater understanding from within himself, this understanding being that part of consciousness which he conceives it to be possible for him to sense, know, or understand. This evening we have a subject which is probably one of the most difficult the entire field of our interest. It has been said that the history of the study of consciousness is the history of religion, philosophy, and science. But these fields all depend finally on the gradual unfoldment of concepts concerning the power to know, the means by which knowledge is attained, and all the other ramifications by which reason and judgment can be derived from experiences of awareness. Some of the uh, early modern philosophers were of the opinion that the term consciousness should be dropped entirely, as having developed gradually around itself such a frustration of meanings that it was no longer possible to use the term or the word intelligibly. Today it means almost anything 
that the individual wants it to mean. He applies it to every type of cognition, and he also involves it in nearly all of his spiritual and religious beliefs and ideas, with the result that semantically the word lost boundaries, and since the 19th century, has been in comparative chaos as to internal structure. I don't agree, however, that we can afford to drop it as a word or seek for a substitute. Rather, I think we must clarify in so much as we can the essential meaning of our term and try to rescue it from the involvements into which it has fallen. As might be naturally supposed, our first difficulty is to define the term consciousness. Trying to discover what it actually means. What do we discover? What do we actually find? Apparently the term consciousness is most generally used to cover the field which we term awareness. It is a power or a faculty by which we are aware. By awareness, we mean awakeness. We mean that these faculties are in a position or in a condition to accept the stimuli that may come to them from a variety of sources, external or internal. Awareness, therefore, is the state of being in the presence of a recognized phenomenon of some kind. We are aware of things around us. And this brings us to the first question that has been asked. Is man aware of the fact that he is aware. Up to a very recent time, there is reason to doubt that. Awareness was an acceptance. The individual turned his attention from one thing to another and accepted into his nature the testimonies of his senses, things seen, heard, touched, flowed into him, but he was not aware of himself in relationship to these things. He was not aware, for example, that his own consciousness accepted or rejected these phenomena by intent or purpose. It was merely a something forever available to become aware of whatever stimuli uh, was brought within its range. <clears throat> Gradually, however, the investigation of phenomena has led to the conclusion that whether we are aware of our own awareness or not, that there is a certain continuous activity from within ourselves, even in the most simple problem of seeing, Seeing is not merely the sense of sight registering its own testimony upon something within man. Seeing involves a motion from within man, a motion of experience, a motion of inevitable and intuitive recognition. The individual seeing, whether he is aware of it or not, immediately begins to estimate the thing seen. Now, principles by themselves were difficult to deal with. A man has never succeeded in dealing with a pure principle. He has never been able to separate a value completely from association with objectivity. If you wish to, for example, try to estimate in your own inner awareness 
the nature of a completely honest person. Now, you're out after a quality. You're out after the quality of honesty. You want to construct for your own purpose an archetypal image of total honesty. It is utterly impossible for you to do so without some recourse to objective symbolism. Man primitive in his thinking first decided that his way to discover the honest man was to find one somewhere in the world around him and then use this person as a pattern for all other honesty. We have done the same thing in religion. We have taken the one good man and made him the archetype of an ideal humanity. We have taken one virtuous person and called his way of life virtue. We have taken him gradually out of it, but we have never lost sight of the example which he gave, which becomes the standard for the estimation of an abstract value. Thus our search for honesty had to center in the honest man. Our search for truth had to be uh, centered in a person who seemingly possessed this power or this invaluable treasure to a pronounced and outstanding degree. Truth without a truthful person or a truthful situation became comparatively unthinkable. So we were never able to completely get away from our dependency upon the records that our awareness had brought to us. Today, when we think of good as a virtue or as a quality, we must associate it with good persons good conditions. We say that something fortunate that occurs to us is good. We must tie it with some phenomenal thing. Thus, as psychology has pointed out, we are not yet in a position to say that what we call consciousness is an, a power within himself begins to pass judgment upon the thing seen. And this judgment is nearly always based upon experience, based upon memory, or upon previous instances in which similar things have been seen, or upon comparison, or perhaps upon the intuitive sense of utilities involved. Whether we know it or not, we always see with a certain appraising power we are constantly passing some kind of judgment about the things seen, accepting it, rejecting it, liking it, disliking it, responding to it pleasurably or without pleasure, actively or passively. Thus there is something within the individual that responds to the pressure of sensory perception and causes awareness to be immediately specialized into a series of judgments, conclusions, attitudes, and opinions. Yet this process occurring almost uh, too rapidly for us to estimate it still does not cause the individual to experience the fact of his own participation in awareness. Most persons, being aware of something, are not aware of their own faculty procedure. They merely accept things seen, mm -hmm. assuming that this is a natural and normal procedure. It is only after the rise of man's philosophic life when he began to question the methodology of things that happened to him, that he began to get frustrated over the problem of his own awareness. Prior to this time, he simply was glad that he had this awareness. 
Gradually, however, the problem of trying to understand it intrigued his mind, intrigued his reason. Now, why should man wish to know how and why he is aware? Probably the answer lies in the gradual arising in human nature of certain doubts. From early time, man became aware of the fallibility of his own judgments. He realized that he could be mistaken, that due to the pressure of some psychic factor within himself, he could not depend upon the validity of his own sensory perception. He learned that he had a power by which he could pervert things seen or things heard, whereby he could interpret into something that which was not in it, or interpret out of it something that was in it. Therefore, that this process of awareness was not necessarily valid. When he began to experience this, he began to experience the need to rationalize this awareness process to discover, if possible, where his own mistakes were. He began to realize also that he could not depend upon the sensory perception for final judgment in important problems. He could believe, as the ancients did, that the sun moved around the earth because it appeared to do so and that when it set in the evening, it went under the earth to light the world of the dead. He had a good deal of phenomenal evidence to sustain him, but he learned gradually that his senses were wrong, that what he appeared to see was not the truth. He learned in many ways that appearances could be deceptive, and by degrees he lost faith in the absolute validity of the initial impact of awareness. <coughs> he became aware, for example, that people who looked nice and were well dressed could still cheat him. He discovered that individuals who looked very healthy could drop dead five minutes later. He discovered that what appeared to be a great bargain was wonderful only on the surface and that appearances could prove very deceiving. He began to become suspicious of surfaces and of appearances, and sought stronger and more positive instruments by which he could judge value. The moment he began to search for the judgment about value, he discovered he had to use certain internal faculties that he had to weigh and ponder and consider. And he gradually divided his mental life into two parts, a concrete or objective mental life, dealing principally with phenomena, and an abstract or subjective mental life that dealt almost totally with principles. 